Welcome to the Audit 15 Fund podcast. My goal with this podcast is to bring relevant internal audit topics to the table at least every 15 days. Today, I have an exciting duel. And to participate in this duel, I have the honor to have as my guests, Alex Sidorenko. He's the head of risk, insurance, and internal audit. And Doug Anderson, former chief audit executive with extensive experience in internal audit. Welcome, gentlemen, to the podcast. It's an honor to have you both on. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. So the topic that you guys are going to be debating is, should we outsource internal audit? Yes or no? And Alex is of the position that, yes, we should. Doug disagrees with that. So really quick here for the audience, Alex will go first. He will have five minutes for his introduction. Doug will have five minutes as well for his opening statement. Then each will have five minutes for their responses and then four minutes, up to four minutes for their conclusion. With that said, Alex, your time starts now. Thanks, John. And so, so today I'm arguing for the need to outsource internal audits. And when we say outsource, we, there's an expectation that there's probably a senior person within the company who kind of manages the process, but then all the kind of the, the, uh, the, the handwork, you know, the, the working papers, everything, the actual field work is outsourced. And, and so I wanted to start my kind of my hypothesis with the quote from a shareholder from one of the biggest chemical companies in the world. And he's view, which I share strongly, uh, was something along the lines that in order to identify the real risks and the real weaknesses in, uh, in, in the processes and the real issues, you really have to deep dive into the subject matter. You have to go very deep, very technical, um, extensively. And so his second point was that in order to do that, the auditor has to have a level of understanding and a level, level of competency at least equal to the, to the owner of the process or the risk owner, you know, call it whatever, um, at least as technically competent, um, if not more. And uh, the, the, the other point he was making is that the quality of the audit reports should be comparable to due diligence reports. And if you can imagine during a transaction, a technical due diligence report, that's like you know, 50 pages, very in-depth analysis after extensive testing, investigation, benchmarking, like really, really in-depth work. And that's where, the, that's where in his mind, uh, uh, the value kind of comes in, is once you start digging really, really deep, really technical, and by somebody who is highly proficient in the subject matter, then you start discovering kind of you know, real underlying issues. Um, and he, you know, he even had a, you know, he even had a, a, word, uh, a, a phrase, don't tell me generalities, tell me you know, technicalities, tell me the specifics, the, the real kind of insights of, uh, um, of operations. Um, so, so that's kind of, that's, uh, that, that, that's really what kind of started this uh, thinking in my mind. You need to have an auditor who is as competent as the subject matter that he is auditing. Now, from that immediately comes the kind of the next conclusion is that there's no way you can afford to do that in-house. That's just way too expensive and it's not effective because for every single audit, uh, you would have you know, engineer for a technical audit, um, logistical person for a logistical audit, uh, maybe an accountant for um, some sort of financial controls, uh, and so on and so on. But there's no way in the world you would keep a set of um, accountants or other generalists, you know, finance or IT generalists. I mean, I'm sure, I mean, I don't know the IT area that deep, but, I, but I'm sure even in IT, the specialization matters big time. Um, and, and so my kind of conclusion from that hypothesis is that it has to be in-depth, technical, very detailed, very comprehensive, is that you simply cannot afford to have that in-house. And 
not only you can't afford it to keep it in-house, you can't really outsource it to a single company. Because I mean, I remember my days back in Australia and most companies outsourced their internal audited to big four, uh, to which, I mean, I've, kind of, I've, been, I've been inside. I saw what a big mistake that was um, because it's naive to think that a group of young accountants can really kind of do justice to a comprehensive, you know, uh, storage or logistical or commercial due diligence slash, uh, uh, slash audit. And um, I kind of, I was, it always surprised me just how little audit findings really mattered, how, how uh, rare they would discover something that was like a life-changing for the company. And yet, if you dig deep enough into any business process, you would dis discover so many inefficiencies, so many you know, flawed practices, so many failed controls that you would really, so, so just the two things just didn't, didn't match up in my mind. Um, so, so my kind of wrapping up my, my point is technical expertise is a must. You can't really keep it in house um, and you need to have the flexibility and the cost efficiency of outsourcing special technical reviews to experts in the field uh, kind of niche consultants or niche auditors that have, and I'm, you know, I'm thinking like you have 20, 30 years extensive experience in their field. Very good. Doug, your opening statement. Sure. Um, I believe that internal audit is best delivered by dedicated internal personnel with a blend of experience levels, a blend of backgrounds, some rotational, some longer term, pulling in those occasional resources outside and expertise when you need it. You know, like the the two young kids I saw walking down the hall once, and I asked my IT guy, who are they? So it's like, oh, they're the ethical hackers, you know, and it's where they went over 14 years old, right? So you you pull in the expertise when you need it. In that case, 30 years wouldn't help very much. I needed the young kids that are doing this on their on their uh, on their own time. I believe the technical parts of auditing can be taught. Right. I, I mostly ran a rotational shop. Most of my people were not long-term auditors. Most of them came in from the organization. I taught them auditing, how, taught them how to think like an auditor, how to use the techniques, how to use the methods, how to write great reports, do those kinds of things. I could even teach independence and objectivity mindset, mostly by example and helping fight fights when fights came along. I can teach all that. Right. So but there's a lot more than that to be a great auditor and to be able to do it. And I, and I would even argue back to some of Alex's comments that <clears throat> uh, let me give you a story about myself. When I first started, I was hired into a Dow chemical as an internal auditor because I graduated from with a finance degree from university of Chicago. So Merton Sh uh, Myron Scholes was teaching when I worked there from the Scholes uh, black Scholes options pricing model. He was an instructor. Eugene Fama was an instructor there the titans of finance and treasury. So they hired me thinking I could go out and audit treasury. Nobody asked me if I knew how to audit treasury. Nobody if I really knew that much about treasury, which I didn't. But I was able to learn it. And I got to the point that at one point I asked the um, head of treasury operations, said, you know, I'm not sure of myself. Maybe I should go hire somebody from one of the outside consulting firms to advise me on, consult advise me on how to audit treasury because I want to make sure I'm doing it right. And he looked at me and said, Doug, I know who you want to hire. You know more about treasury than they do. Because I sat for hours with the traders. I sat for hours with the people, having them explain to me how this company approaches it and how they do it. And I could ferret out what the issues were. But leaving the technical side apart, there's a lot more to being a great internal auditor than technical. Multiple surveys of stakeholders. And I'd be interested, maybe Alex will have to talk offline about the chemical company, because that's my industry, right? It's the chemical industry. Um, but surveys of stakeholders, large surveys, small surveys, say the number one thing that auditors need is business acumen. More important than audit techniques or skills, it's business acumen. Understand how the business works. And I don't think Alex and I disagree on that. You need to understand how the business is tied together and that specific business, how it works, and you need to be a good, effective internal auditor. You need relationships, relationships with middle managers, relationships with upper management, relationships with the front line. Auditing is best performed within the context of strong relationships. And then another key thing you need is understanding the culture. How do I approach it? 
how do the people in the organization approach what we're talking about? How are they looking at the risks? How are they missing it? To be able to put things in context and, and maybe even understand problems in, in the culture. So these are, I believe, unique attributes internal people will bring that the external hired gun won't bring because we have the time and the continuity to understand the way the business runs, understand how relationships work and build relationships. I know people all over the world because I specifically worked on building those relationships so that when I had an issue, we didn't get defensiveness. We didn't get arguments. We didn't have problems. We worked through it because they trusted me. I knew them. And then the learning that you go through this stays in the company. We learn something about how supply chain works, whether you're gonna use flexi packs or whether you're gonna use ISO containers or what you're gonna use, what taking butadiene across rail for 400 kilometers versus doing it another way, what does that mean and why is that important? That learning stays in the audit team and we have it and we can disseminate it. So you build a bench strength of understanding what's going on. And we had people that had different areas of expertise, but it worked that way. Hired guns, I'm sorry, I never found them cheap. I found them effective, but never cheap. They can come in to do specific tasks, but you're not gonna get the same mindset and approach. And at the end of the day, they're running a for-profit business. I've been a consultant, I've done that. They're both working for you, but they're also working to make money off of who? You, where when I have my internal people, their future, their motives, what they're doing is all aligned to help the organization get better. And not only do we know it, but the whole organization knows it. So you both agree that yes, you need business acumen. I think that's the point of agreement between the two of you. Absolutely. You bring an interesting point there, Doug. The knowledge stays in the company when you're insourcing. Alex, your response? Um, so so that's, that's interesting because we, we agree that you need uh, business acumen. We clearly disagree or have a different perspective of what that means or the level of uh, business acumen. Um, my, my initial point was and kind of still is, is that the level of detail, and I think this is a bit of a case of uh, you know, Dunning-Kruger's effect where every auditor auditing first, you know, the business process for the first time um, is comfortable that he did a good job. And uh, most of the people, when they look at the findings and compare the findings from a kind of an auditor who discovering and learning how to audit the process and understanding the, the business acumen, the level of detail, the depth, and the, the significance of the issues identified and the kind of the, the insights gained from that are uncomparable to an expert who's been doing this specialized for a very, very long time. Um, so, so in my mind, I think this is where we basically disagree most. Um, in my experience, the objective of internal audit is to dig so deep to discover things that the, the rest of the company is not even aware of that they exist, not pick up on the obvious kind of um, you know, obvious things that, that everybody uh, everybody everybody in the company knows and is not surprising, but to really dig that deep. And for that, you need expertise, which just doesn't exist in-house um, without conflict of interest. So the, it's, I, I mean, I wouldn't disagree that it's not cheap to, to hire an external person, but that's kind of, that's at least a justified expense. Um, keeping a group of generalists who audit different processes high level to come up with kind of Captain Obvious type responses um, that don't really make a huge amount of money for the company because the differences or the recommendations they provide are not particularly uh, useful or insightful. Um, that, I mean, again, to me, that to me is, uh, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty simple business case. You, you pay, but you also get in return 100 times more quality and uh, uh, findings and recommendations. You know, that's, for example, every time I, um, I need to look at you know, understanding the risks associated with insurances, I hire external risk engineers because what they can discover um, is uncomparable to what we can discover, um, discover internally. And uh, the 
kind of the big challenge, and you know, it's it's not it's not it's not kind of it's not in guaranteed success story. The big challenge, of course, is to look for external consultants that are um, prepared to dig deeper. Because again, as as Doug kind of mentioned, there's the whole consulting business is built on copy pasting high level uh, generic observations. Very few companies and individuals in, on the planet are willing to dig deep. Like, you know, for example, I had risk engineers who copy paste reports, and I and I fired them halfway <laughs> through the project. And I have risk engineers who literally walk into every single room in the plant, trying to see what's so special about this room. Are there any specific risks um, in this? In, and you know, when I'm saying each room in the plant, I, I literally mean. You have every room in the plant, and that's a lot of, a lot of manual work, um, uncommon for you know, most risk engineers. And yet, the people that do that, that do dig deep enough and provide you know, in-depth um, due diligence, the difference that they make, the recommendations, the kind of the the, the savings that come from their recommendations, are just on a different level. So that's I think that's kind of that's my. That's my biggest response. Um, all of the other benefits of keeping the knowledge in house uh, and everything else that Doug mentioned kind of just uh, shrinks or is on the scale of kind of you know having really insightful, deep recommendations and findings and everything else. It, to me, it's a kind of it's a it's a very simple choice. Doug, you sure. need to dig deep. Sure go beyond the obvious you can't have a generalist to do that yeah and and i i had the luxury of a group large enough that i was able to have people specialize so that that was nice and i know not every small group has the ability to have some people specialize but i always had my treasury specialist i always had my manufacturing specialist i always had my marketing specialist within my audit team and they had done a number of audits so we we try to mitigate it do they have the same level of expertise that somebody that's been 30 years in marketing absolutely not Right. I will never pretend that they do. But I think it comes into a little bit difference of the intention of what internal auditing is. If I have to have an auditor go into every room in a plant, I know before, I can write the audit report on the first day because then the management is not running their operation well. And the issue isn't for auditing to go in there and find every problem deep into the rooks and crannies of every single room in that organization. I'm really out there to see whether management is managing risk well, managing their operation, managing the risk well. I expect management to do that. I don't expect internal auditing to go in there, find all the problems, tell them how to fix it, and then they walk away saying, oh, this is great. You just did my job for me. No, I'm going to go in and say, hey, my job. My job is to see whether you're doing your job right. And I don't need to go into every single room in the plant to find out whether you're doing your job right or not. I've had many situations where audit manager, or I'm sorry, line management expected internal audit to fix their problems, internal audit to assess every problem they had. It's like, that's not me. I've had a number of audit reports. I've called out and basically said, management, you're the problem. You don't understand your risks. You don't deploy your resources. You haven't hired the consultant you need to fix your problems. When I'm limited in my resources and in internal audit, there's no possible way with at one point at Dow before our big Roman Haas acquisition, we had 600 plants. Think of how many people I'd need to go into every room of 600 plants. I can't do that. It's just not possible with the resources I had. But what I can do is assess whether management understands their risks and is doing their job well enough. That I can do. And But what's more important, I think, for what we were trying to get to is really being able to ish deal with the difficult issue, the tough issues. You don't know how many times I was told by vice presidents and above that I was going to lose my job if I took that position. I was always right. I never lost my job. They just didn't like the answer. They didn't like me calling them out on their inability to do their job right. They didn't. I remember very clearly one executive VP. I had to tell him to shut up and sit down because he was bringing risk on the company that he was not properly managing and he needed to deal with it, not me. He did not like that message. Clearly he didn't like it, but that was my responsibility to bring the message, not to go in and take over everything and find all of his issues. It was, you're the problem. I've sat across from many VPs and say, 
you're the problem. You're the issue because you're not managing your company well. As a third line, that's what I do. And it's really hard for an outside party to understand the culture, the relationships, the business well enough to sit in that office, put their career on the line and say, I know I'm right because I've been around here for many, many years and you're wrong and you need to fix it. And those are the things that I think an internal owner really needs to do. Those are the tough, impactful things we can do. I can hire a consultant to go out and find some money saving, sure. That's not my job. That's management's job. My job is when management's not doing that to call it out and it's only not managing the risk well. So I think part of Alex and my different view here is around my view of what internal auditing is supposed to do is slightly different than what Alex's view. And maybe it's the nature of the companies we've worked with because internal auditing has to have different roles in different companies. But my view is an internal group is the kind of group they can take the tough issues, develop those kind of relationships, acumen, understanding of culture to deal with the tough issues, to hold management accountable, not to fix issues. So internal audit's job is to assess how well management is digging deep versus internal audit digging deep themselves. Alex, your response and closing remarks. Uh, well, so, so I don't really know how to respond to this because everything Doug just said, if you if you said it kind of if I said it in my argument, it would literally be exactly the same. Uh, so, and that's that, that's uh, that's the difference between I think generalities and uh, you know specific things. Um, I, I agree with all the points. It's that the only difference is that it doesn't support the, bu the business case of in-house versus uh, outsourced. You know, the, the statements can be exactly the same for outsourced or for the, uh, the in-house. They're just kind of, they're just generic kind of, you know, important principles. And uh, I think we all agree on the principles. That's not the point we're, we're trying to make. The point I'm trying to make is that the ammunition that an external expert brings you to the table to do exactly what you would do what Doug just described is just on a different level. It's uncomparable to what an in-house uh, person, even a specialized person uh, can bring. I mean, we also had specialized people in different directions. And when I compared apples to apples, what the specialized person in-house brings to the, uh, to the process owner, to the decision maker, to the head of internal audit, who then still goes ahead and you know, sits down and has all the relationship, like none of these things uh, taken out of the equation. Yes, relationships are important. Y yes, uh, internal auditor puts his uh, job on the line by standing his ground. Like all of these things are not an in-house versus outsourcing issue. They're just generic principles that I think we both agree on. Uh, but the apples to apples comparison, the quality of issues, findings, the insights that an external person specializing brings to the table to allow head of internal audit to do all of the things that Doug said, they're just, they're just non-comparable. It's, uh, it's like, uh, I don't know, it's like shooting plastic bullets versus uh, live ammunition. Uh, if I can kind of finish with that analogy. <laughs> all right, Doug, well, it's about yeah, the quality. I guess the, the VPs that I called out and got fired for mismanaging their portfolio probably wouldn't call the bullets plastic. But we'll leave that to the side. I mean, I, and I think the I, I I think we agree on one level, but the the core to me is the way you position and you get equipped to be able to have those conversations, to have that insightful, and to deal with the tough issues, and to, to know where you want to look. I got six hundred plants. I can't look at all of them. Which ones am I going to look at? I mean, I one time made a mistake as a CAE telling the audit committee I had a list of executives that I kind of watch after, and they're like. Well, who's on your list? Well, I can't tell you. I mean, that's not, it was my objective. My objective was over my career in internal audit, outside of internal audit, because I spent quite a few years as the global business finance director for a business with 20 plants around the world, doing marketing and all that kind of jazz that you do in that kind of job. And, and then coming back into the CAE, I built relationships through that whole time period. And I leveraged all of those in that time period. And some of my examples were not as a CAE. There is the auditor telling people what they need to do. And I still think 
that the internal person is the one that can do that. The external person never can have the same level of knowledge of the business and how the business runs and how the culture works and how the relationships work within the organization. I knew every executive personally. I knew how they thought and I knew how they operated and I knew how their organizations operated. No external consultants would have that kind of mindset. And my specialists, which were in the various buckets, had the same kind of knowledge within their buckets. And I think that makes an effective audit. Can we ferret out the the um the little cost save, the cost saving, big cost saving, the big problem here there? I think we can, but more likely we're going to find management can't do it. And that's really our focus, whether management can do those jobs, because internal audit, we don't have the resources to do it. Never did. And we never would. All right. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining the podcast. Really appreciate it. As usual, I will let the audience decide. <laughs>